speech gets pulled. The phraseology gets muted. You don't say what you really wanted to say. And uh, for whatever reason, and we all have nights like that, uh, and people can read through it. And if you do nothing but that and say, you know, gosh, this really wasn't a good show, but I better be supportive of theater, you know, uh, because the thing is, not everybody goes to the theater as much as we do. And it's also expensive. That's the, the, the last point I guess I should make. Unless it's pay what you can night, and even that costs money, we get our tickets free. But, you know, I took my family back to see a show at Stratford again this summer. Yeah. <laughs> they haven't told you that. But I took my family back to see As You Like It at Stratford because I had enjoyed it so much that I wanted them to see it. And, well, you know, by the time I bought four tickets and we drove to Stratford and we had lunch, it was $650 for the day. Okay? Now, it turned out the show was really good the second time and we enjoyed it, but I stood there and thought, you know, if I was... If I was an average person, I'd consider this, you know, I'd think about it. Um, and it's true, I mean, the, the cost of things, I tend to be a little more cavalier about recommending things highly sometimes when it comes to the fringe, because hey, it costs less, it's an easy atmosphere, what are you gonna lose? You're gonna lose an hour of your life and maybe 10 bucks? Come on, give it a chance. But if it gets to be the Lord of the Rings and it costs $125, I'm not gonna cut much slack, I'm sorry. You know, it's going to be, you have set yourself up as the largest, most expensive, wonderful show in the world. Well, you damn well better be. Uh, by the same token, that doesn't mean I'm nice to everything that's done by an alternate theater. Uh, because sometimes, you know, if you praise everything done by every alternate theater, then when you do come out of the woodwork and say, there is this show being done in this basement that you've never heard of before, run to it, people won't believe you. So it's a really thin line between you know, being nurturing to the art form, but not being, you know, not going around throwing the manure everywhere. <laughs> Robert? I can't think of a single critic in Toronto who is nice to everything, uh, or who goes around um, thinking they should be nice to everything because um, they better keep the theater alive, if only as opposed to keep themselves in work. It, 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 doesn't, it really doesn't, doesn't work like that. Um, I don't think we're as nasty as most people think we are, but we're not all that nice either from that, that, from that point of view. Um, but um, Richard mentioned about not writing, not writing people in the theater, and I think the, the, the truth is you can't, and I think he and I both would know this rather well because I haven't had as much professional experience as Richard has, but I've had quite a lot. And like him, I've continued to work in the theater from time to time while being a critic. And um, what I realized from doing both things is there is very little common ground in terms of how you review a show. Uh, because somebody who lives with the show for three hours, not many things last longer than that, is in a very different position from somebody who's lived with it for weeks or months, maybe even years, if they're the playwright. Uh, there's just no way. This doesn't mean, by the way, that the critic is always nastier to it than the people concerned would be. Uh, because what I actually found myself as a practitioner was that I could get away with stuff that I thought everybody was, everybody was going to murder me for. And that I could also, on the other hand, I would curse them for ignoring stuff that I was terribly proud of. There is really no way, once you're inside something, of seeing what it's like from outside. And even a favorable review is likely to come as a, you know, a blast of cold water. Uh, suddenly you think, I don't know that. I, I, I didn't realize that. I remember once working in a show with an, an actor who said um, he could read all the reviews the next day or whenever they came out of a show he was in, and he could, and they'd be different, but he could actually see exactly where each review was coming from, and he could place himself in the position of that particular critic. I think that was unusually broad-minded of him. But I, th I, th I think one does realize that the critical perspective is totally different. Um, I think the question of whether practical experience actually helps you to be a critic is a, is a very thorny and complicated one. I think all I can say is it does help some people and certain types of critics and a lot of others get along perfectly well without it. So there's no, there, there, there's no um, overall correlation between the two. Um, I think the kind of stuff I write is helped a bit by my at least knowing who is supposed to have done what if we're dealing with a, a collaborative art form. But uh, there are plenty of critics I respect who you know, have never worked in the theater and wouldn't want to. <laughs> what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't one. Just make there wasn't one. Yeah, there wasn't one. Uh, balance? Try balance, or I can ask a new question. No, I'll answer that question. Um, the theater critic 
is a professional member of an audience and the theater review the review should be for the audience and if the audience happens to be or the audience or the reader or the person who's listening and if the reader listener whatever happens to be the actor director a uh, person who's going to buy a ticket person who didn't buy a ticket person who has bought a ticket you're you're doing the review for the person who's listening to the review and you can't really differentiate you look at the piece you talk about the piece did it work did it not what was the intention was it worth doing you try to be as fair as you can it's tempting to be to slash and burn you you can't uh, you have to be balanced as as my colleagues have said and you just do your best all right well I'm going to Im impose that you you all do your best a little bit here and actually uh, show a little work I know uh, I know everyone's fresh off seeing Lord of the Rings and the all of that um, so I guess I'm wondering wh what do you think about the current state of, of Canadian theater and where it's it's headed Lord of the Rings is not Canadian Lord of the Rings has a cast all Canadians and it was developed created etc by um, people from England well that, yeah I understand let's leave the blockbuster out I guess and get beyond that and say what Canadian you know. theater over the uh, over the la I think one one of the sample questions was what where has it gone from the last 20 years um, I, there used to be a time when people would say Canadian theater is our people standing at the sink whining so it's kitchen sink theater we've now got gone into other rooms in the house <laughs> we've, we've looked outside the house we have plays that talk about politics that talk about the world uh, that deal with philosophical questions with that deal with uh, intellectual questions it's developed it's also very young it's at least it's 60 years old which is nothing compared to the the compared to this theater in England compared to theater in New York and so you shouldn't compare it with anything else it's our own and it's developing and it will continue to develop and get better some of it's good some of it has to get better but uh, it's just a developed it's a developing art form huh? mm -hmm. No, I agree with Lynn on a lot of that. Uh, to break it down specifically, and this is sitting through, as he said, hundreds of stuff a year, I think we're blessed with the actors we have in this country. We consistently have excellent actors. Uh, you hardly ever find actors letting a production down. I mean, occasionally an actor does a bad performance. Occasionally an actor gets miscast. But they're not the ones you blame. By the same token, while we're dealing out praise, I think that especially for people who don't have a lot of money to work with, we have some incredibly brilliant designers in this country uh, who do magical work. Uh, we, we have some of the finest lighting designers that I've seen around the world working here in Toronto, and they do it in theaters with four lamps, you know? And you think, how do they do it? Now let's go to the debit side of the ledger. Uh, we have a lot of very good playwrights, and they are not given the right situations in which to operate. Uh, sigh of agreement. I have seen so many plays that have been ostensibly workshopped lengthily and then all of the critics in the city after one performance see exactly what's wrong with it and you think why didn't everybody else in all these workshops see what was wrong with it? Uh, they're not developed properly. We often sell a lot of our talent down the river. We give playwrights too much we put too heavy a mantle on their shoulders too soon. We start producing everything they write, and we don't give them a chance to work properly. And one of the reasons ties into, I think, this country's greatest weakness, unfortunately, is directors. Uh, as I said, if we're blessed and rich in, in actors, we don't have a heck of a lot of great directors. We have some adequate ones. We have a few brilliant ones. We have some that are erratic. but. It's, if you want to compare, as I said, the wealth of actors and the poverty of directors, it's a gap. And if we are to keep moving ahead and getting stronger, I think we somehow have to find a way of, of addressing this problem. Developing our playwrights better and building stronger directors. Actors and designers, we're rich. Robert? What makes you think that's different here from anywhere else? <laughs> no, I came, I, I, no, I mean, I, I, I came here you know, from England nearly 20 years ago. 
um, which means I had a, a fair amount of I've seen a fair amount of theatre in the UK, well, a lot of theatre in the UK.